Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Daniel Young. I'm the owner and founder of Adapted Perspective and the Adapted Perspective social media platforms. And I am back with another strategy session on the market at large and how we can use closed-in funds to improve our investing. This is an unedited video, so who knows what you'll hear in the background as I film these in my house. Uh, the cat is, it's his witching hour, so maybe you'll hear him, maybe you'll see him, maybe not. Uh, I am not a financial advisor. I am a financial strategist, and I don't speak like the herd. I walk in limited company, and most often I walk alone. So the biggest thing for the market at large, and as I planned this video, I wanted a... And I wanted less scripting. Uh, I wanted less lead-in. And the push right now is this fear of missing out. And you've got the CNN Fear and Greed Index pushing extreme greed uh, or maybe swinging into extreme greed. And you've got people, uh, Bloomberg especially, pushing people into bonds. And it, it's the... It really is a FOMO environment where it's a fear of missing out. You want to be in the mix, but I would be extremely cautious on what you're getting pushed into. The places to be right now are in bonds, utilities, and energy. The problem is that's not where I would invest right now. Uh, you Ideally, so if you were in any of those places, you started investing really six months to maybe 18 months ago. Um, some some of those bond funds we bought maybe th two and three months ago, but it was extremely choosy on what we were buying into. Uh, we demanded discount more than anything. But, excuse me, but we're not, we're not, we're not buying that stuff right now. That's, I mean, the, it really is that the new investor, new money into the market is pushing it, which more power to them because it really just pushes up our value. So they're pushing into bonds and utilities and energy. But that's, I mean, yeah, I guess you still have some options for those. You, you still have some significant discounts for those, but you're going to be paying more for it now than you were six months to 18 or even 24 months ago. So if we're not investing into those three things, what should we be investing in? I'm still in the overall caution mindset. Um, it's with the Fed cutting rates once and everything up, which you would expect. Rates go down. When rates drop, everything ought to go up. But I still don't think the economy is that great. Uh, Boeing is laying off, which you could argue is either, you know, as a result of their poor management and uh, making crappy planes or because of the underlying economic issues across our country. Uh, the Fed cut rates. Yes, they cut it a half percent. Yes. But shortly thereafter, the consumer price index rose and you have core inflation rising, which doesn't make sense for the rate cut. Like why cut rates if things aren't that great? Well, it gives the Fed a position of positive, uh, kind of positive perception right before the election. Uh, they're trying to push confidence into the market. We were... We were too high for too long. They cut rates. Hey, we're in a great spot. They're trying to inject money back into the market. And it worked for a little bit. And it's still working for the most part. But I don't think the economy is what they're selling it as. So where does that leave us? Not a bank option. I think it, your nest egg for you know 30 years from now, I think that's a really poor strategy. I think that's a killer on your overall nest egg. You're losing at least 4% from inflation from, from inflation every single year on your nest egg. Uh, single stocks, not my angle. 
Uh, I, I don't see a sustainability there. There, <laughs> I know kids in, in, relative to age. I know kids who are buying Nvidia just to sell Nvidia, but that means you have to watch things every single day. And there's a ton of risk wrapped up in one stock, and they're just trading one stock. They're not trading twenty like a like a regular portfolio. I think the 60-40 stock to bond op, uh, option or ratio inside a portfolio is not a great idea. It's too generic and it's also too diversified and that you have to maintain the ratio or or close, but it also doesn't allow you to, to strategically invest. You should not pick uh, funds based on a ratio you should pick funds based on what the best option now is four five ten e either short duration six months to three years maybe right or five years ten years down the road it's what can you buy now at an amazing discount at amazing cheap price with a decent dividend that will carry you forward where you can sell it for a quick profit before you push those into something else uh, or swing those into something else, or what can you buy and hold? I think the 4% rule is a joke. I mean, the 4% rule in, in its premise requires you to have at least a million dollars invested that you would draw 4% from annually. So it's taking money from your principal. So you're getting 40,000 annual or 3,300 a month-ish. But it also requires the market to go up at least 8% a year, 8, 4% to offset what you're taking out, 4% for inflation so that you can maintain. I don't think that's a great idea. I think we have to look long-term. Now, long-term can be relative, right? So we, 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 what I just said, it's we use the current market and our closed-end fund strategy to pick something we can either buy and hold indefinitely. Like the bond rally, who knows when the bond rally will end? The current energy rally, who knows when that'll end, right? So we can either buy, which we've done, and hold it and sell it at its apex before it drops. Or we can keep it when it drops and just buy more of it, knowing it's going to go back up. Or we can sell it and we can take those proceeds, the dividends and the gain from selling the fund and swing that or push that into the next buy. So what's the best place right now? I mean, that's really the, the, the best question for now is where's the next best place to be? Bonds, utilities, and energy are where you should be. And that's relative to where you should have been six to 18 months ago, maybe 24 months ago, right? So if you bought bonds, utilities and energy when they were the dogs of the market uh, 12 months, 24 months ago, then you're sitting pretty right now. And when new investors pile into those things, that's just pushing your share value up and hopefully maybe your dividends up. But that's not the place to be right now. Like that's not the thing to buy on Monday. So what should we buy on Monday? So check out these tabs and I'll share them with you. So check out these tabs and look at what I typed in the search box. So do stock prices fall in a recession? Stock prices fall. So the Fed cuts rates. They cut longstanding high interest rates and everything gains. But eventually companies struggle to make ends meet. So you end up with layoffs and as companies sustain or as companies struggle to sustain right and the economy slows that's called a recession amongst other things now if they change the dictionary again which they've done before at least once if they change the dictionary definition of recession again we'll see but stocks fall during a recession so the Fed cuts rates, stocks and bonds go up, utilities go up, real estate goes like everything goes up for the most part, right? But if, eventually we're going to hit the official recession and then stock prices will fall and bond prices will continue to go up. Utilities will probably continue to go up. 
but stocks not. So that's kind of why I'm avoiding stocks at the moment. So where I, I looked at all this last week, but I, I went ahead and pulled it back up. I think it's interesting what the AI overview is compared to everything else you can find on Google. So when rate when rates drop, where do most people invest? Bonds. Yes, but they're late to the party. The bond party was a year to two years ago when bonds were at the absolute filthiest lowest. Like nobody wanted to touch those things. That's when you should have bought bonds. And now people are looking for dividend paying stocks, but really preferred paying stocks, something that'll pay even during a recession. Or you're looking at a real estate investment trust or just real estate, right? So stock prices fall. Where should people in, or where do people invest in a rate drop? Real estate. With stagflation, inflation that just remains stagnant or it's up and down, up and down. Real estate assets, whether that's buying a rental property or buy, or investing into real estate inside the market. Uh, let's see, where do investors invest when the consumer price index is high? Real estate. Uh, where do most people invest when there's a recession? Real estate. Again, bonds will be late to the party. Dividend stocks, you're late to the party. Defensive sectors, this is still consumer stuff. Consumer sector, all of this is consumer related to a degree. I think the consumer sector is way too, um, it's way too overused. It's way too overpopulated in a way. Uh, real estate, you, you can label as a consumer product because it has highs and lows based on your individual market. So stop the share again. So the dog of the market that I found right now remains to be real estate. And it's, it's, it's not every fund. Uh, we have a real estate fund that's done really well and can't touch it right now because it's either in premium or uh, well above what we bought it. So if there's anything that would tempt me to buy in the remaining two and a half months this year. Right now it's real estate, but it's a cautious thing. You have the Fed tinkering with the economy, the economy's slowing. Congress is spending 2 trillion more than what is currently in the bank. And that money's gonna have to come from somewhere. Now the Fed can easily print it and, ca and cause higher inflation, which means we would just pay for it again. Or they can increase taxes, which they swear they're not gonna do. Right. But if if Congress overspends by two trillion, you and I are going to end up paying for that one way or another. We'll either pay for it directly with taxes or two, the Fed will print it and we'll pay higher taxes and more from inflation. And I prefer that the Fed not print money. I also prefer that Congress not spend more than what it has because it's not their money. It's our money. It's tax. <laughs> It's taxpayer money, not government spending. It's taxpayer money. But that's a that's related and also a, a very different discussion than this. So in stagflation, when, when people are hesitant to invest and Congress is spending like crazy and you and I are not. Now, the hot button topic is immigration, and and my purpose is not to be political. So whether you, I mean, I can be political, but I, I try not to be political uh, unless I need to be. So regardless of your stance on immigration, you have a giant influx of people coming to our country for any number of reasons. All of those people need housing. So we are on short supply for housing. It's a strain on the healthcare community, on biotechs, on pharmaceuticals, on everybody, right? So you have a giant upswing of people. You have fierce competition for, for real estate, but also for everything that goes along with being a consumer and being a person who lives in this country. And it's putting a strain on everything. So whether you like immigration or not, 
we have it right now. Like that's that's the landscape of things right now. And what it's doing to the real estate market is putting more stress and more pressure on manufacturers and the available housing that depending your market, real estate is, is becoming scarce. Like real estate go, does go through cycles. It, it You have an influx of people, manufacturers build like crazy. As more things come online, um, you have people renting that, that it takes pressure off, but everybody's still building. And right now we've got that scarcity mentality where a ton of people need homes. We're still building home. Like we're in that swing. We're in, we're not in the downward phase of, of real estate. It's like, we're here. You have tons of people building and we're waiting for some type of surplus on market. And as people buy or rent, you'll have less, you, you'll still have things being made but you'll have less available and then it'll catch back up. So as things come online, the demand will stay. Now, if the border stays open, we'll be here for longer or we'll make it into an, more like an egg instead of a circle, right? But as needs get met, that will not so much level, but we'll reach a point where it's saturated, right? Or, or contained and demand will drop and we'll continue to build and then we'll go through the circle again. So to me, real estate makes the most sense. It's, it's needed now. It's needed long-term. You can, you can talk your way around a circle of justifying rents and expenses until you're blue in the face. But in the current market, and long-term, real estate seems like a really interesting option. Really seems like the best option. So of the funds, bear that in mind. So this is the closed-end fund master. The colors have been updated, meaning like light blue, dark blue, green, or I guess this is olive uh let's see purple is here somewhere purple those have been updated uh gray and white get updated or i guess gray and no color get updated uh every month everything else gets updated weekly so if we take our triple asterisk list which has gotten a lot smaller and we plug it into the spreadsheet interesting there we go. We plug it into the spreadsheet. High fixed income, not on there anymore. Bonds and loans. Interesting. Yeah, real estate remains. So as we go down the list, we're looking for monthly not interested in category, really any kind of category where it pays quarterly. So we're looking at monthly. Now we're going based on yield. So everything has a significant discount. Everything's a target for any number of reasons. Really, um, I, I do these videos. Um, I get complacent, I guess you could say, when I do these videos. So triple asterisk is a buy alert. That means the existing discount is uh, greater than the five-year discount and double the historical discount. Um, or if it's a newer company like this one, there's a little, a little bit of grace there. So for this, this is a stocks fund. It's not it's not a bond or anything else, but it's a stocks fund. So it, even though we're not targeting stocks, it still gets a triple asterisk just based on discounts. So we're looking at uh, the current discount is greater than double the historical discount. It's also greater than the existing five-year discount. 
then two would be a dollar cost average based on what we already own. Uh, one is, I mean, we are either we already own it and we're tracking it still, or we're still just tracking it for any number of reasons. This is the, the real estate fund we already, well, we own two, I guess you could say, maybe three real estate funds, but this is one we already own where the price is higher, but it's also a premium. And even though it's a three cent premium, meaning if the discount were break even like this, every dollar you put in is a dollar invested, or maybe every dollar you invest is a is worth a dollar overall. But if we look at the discount like this is 54% off, that's like 54 cents. So you're paying 46 cents for every dollar invested. So you're, you're getting a fantastic deal versus this is a 10% premium. It's like a 1.1 for every dollar invested. So here, so we're back. So all of them are tri triple asterisks for those discount reasons. We've been targeting 9% and above. Uh, blue is what we already own. Green is we track for any number of reasons. Now, if we really sort this out, municipal bond, utility, municipal bond, right? The, the party already left for those things. Or the boat already left for those things. That's a real estate fund. This is stocks. So stock, stock. Calamosa stocks. TIF is, it's everything energy, but not oil. But all of their renewable energy sources require oil in order to be made. It's, it's very counterproductive to me. It doesn't make sense. It, it makes sense in the in the sense of I get it's a re, it's a renewable energy fund, but all of those things will break down, and you'll still have to have oil in order to make more of those things. That's not renewable. Uh, some of them actually damage the environment quite considerably. Uh, NBXG is stocks. CIF is it's bonds. It, it's it's a super small bond company that. Uh, I mean, they're, they're loaded with it, with fixed income and, co and corporate bonds. That's not our target right now. Maggie is a utility company. That doesn't make the list. This is a supersized bond company. You, even their own private lender now. Uh, that's a bond company. This is a mix. I mean, you can kind of see where this is going. So HGLB is a mix of things. It's bonds a little bit. It's real estate, some energy and utilities. Thing is, this, this, and this, the market has already sailed on those things. So even though they've got some real estate and some consumer products, it's not a focus. The only thing on our existing uh, possibilities list, this triple asterisk list, the only thing that satisfies the metrics, right? considerable discount, or I guess considerable discount. It meets the target parameters. It doesn't meet the yield. It doesn't meet the 9% yield guideline, but I'm willing to tweak that. But it, it is real estate focused. And if you pause this and read through this box, like it won't offend me. Pause the video and read through the box. And then come over here and it's kind of the same thing, to be honest. It's almost the same thing in this box. A little, I try to make the target box more related to the discount as opposed to, to the general information box. But read this box as well. And then let's let's look at this graph. So if we dig back through the inception or through the uh, distribution, we'll see that about end of 2017, early 2018, the company restructured. And I could go, I could go back and, and learn more about the company pre that date, but I, I, I don't need to. Since that time, it was 
it's it's like a it's like a hedge fund of hedge funds for bonds. They paid a, a an incredibly consistent dividend. I was part of the company, or I was a, a shareholder at one point. Uh, I mean, really, I, I I don't I can go back and look when I became a shareholder. I want to say in here, uh, and it was an incredibly consistent dividend. And then they restructured again. Same management team, very different focus. They changed from a bond-focused hedge fund style company to real estate. And that's really what you see here. So like in this area, and I don't know the impetus for that. And that's kind of what we see on the graph. So of their value. If this company, if this company liquidated tomorrow and sold all their assets, you would have your buy-in price of whatever you paid, and it would sell for this price per share. And it's maintained that value. I mean, it's it's gone up and down a little bit, but since about a year ago, a little more than a year ago, it's grown in value consistently. But we still have the slide here. So in, if we change our understanding of the graph, or maybe we change the wording, instead of it tracking price, if we changed it to say confidence or comfort level, however you want to, uh, really, I would say confidence. So the company changes its portfolio right about where my mouse is. And it changes it from a bond fund into a real estate fund. And not all the real estate is online, meaning they sold the bond stuff. Now everything they own is real estate based. They have real estate bonds, but everything they own is real estate based. And, and we all got the missives. But there wasn't like a, this is why we did it explanation. So everybody's just kind of left scratching their heads. And not everything is online. They invested into single family homes and multifamily homes and healthcare and this and that. And it's all interesting up and coming needs, but it's not all rented yet. So they're sustaining the existing dividend. They also cut the dividend. So if we go back to the distribution and look at the last year, right after January, they cut their dividend in half. And with not everything online, they're paying half a dividend. Now, as things come back online, or maybe not come back online, but as they ramp up and come online, like as their healthcare space gets finished and rented out, that'll actually start to generate revenue, especially in a smaller interest rate market. You have single family homes and multifamily units being built as we speak, that as they're rented, that would in, that would improve profit and also dividend. So if we put it in perspective, which this used to be our share about or our availability, it's, it's not anymore since we sold some funds, really one fund. Um, but the dividend used to be this. That's considerably higher than than nine percent. Now, I don't think it'll automatically jump there. It's been at this since January. It would be great if they raised it a little bit. And it's not going to take much to boost it closer to nine. But they've been paying the bills and paying the dividends for that matter yeah. with I mean, it's a complete portfolio in the sense that everything's invested, but at the same time, not everything is producing rent. It'd be like building an apartment complex and paying your bills while it's being built. And then you have a floor finished and it's like, all right, they rent it out and you're still paying your bills, but not everything is rented out yet. And that's kind of like their portfolio in general. The thing is, the switch was so, stu was so sudden with little reasoning behind it. Investor sentiment, investor confidence has just tanked. Even though the overall value 
has continued to gain because since it's real estate, even when the economy sucks, even when interest rates are high, real estate and good real estate, even crappy real estate, but good real estate gains value. So it's selling for an obscene discount, 54% off. That's like paying 46 cents for every dollar invested. You're getting it for super cheap. And we would too. So if I come back here, we sold this fund at the bottom on Friday. 942, it was like 200, I think, 230 something. So it'd be like 230 something. It's late. Uh, where are we? So here equals. We'd have about that. I mean, that's an easy hundred dollar pickup. I doubt we could do that. It'd be close. But there is a but. We're not investing tomorrow because the bulk of this money is still being finalized in the other account. I've got to be able to wait for it to be officially ended and available, withdraw it, go through that process, re-upload it, because it's not just a, an easy transfer from one account to the other. It's got to come all the way out and then go all the way back in. But if we were investing tomorrow, and if those funds were available tomorrow, that's what we would invest in. We would pick up a hundred spot of HFRO on top of what we already own, which is here. So it, it would be 300. And I, I only know this because I did the math the other day. It would drop our overall share price, maybe three cents, maybe. If we picked up 200, it would drop it further because it's the math for 40 grand a year. So if equal share price, right? 6.33 plus 5.9. Divide that by two, you're looking at like 614 a share or 614 here if we bought 200 shares. So it's really weird for me to only have one thing on the list. I mean, if I look back and there's always been multiple things on the list, for a while, for any number of reasons. Um, yeah, bonds, bonds, bonds plus the mixed fund. Uh, I had two weeks of advising caution and this. So for us and everything I can dig into and read, everything I can infer from the market now looking forward, the best place to be now is kind of scary to be honest because when you find the dog you find the dogged corner or the dog corner of the market nobody's there because it's scary to be there but that's often what you're looking for it's that diamond in the rough thing it's that dirty coin buried in sludge that you're going to have to shine up a little bit and then it's just patiently waiting real estate now for whatever reason people are not into for any i i can't i mean i, I really don't get it i it, rfi is real estate for us that's got a mix that's up only thing i can really see about that specific fund is people are just uncertain it's that the the closed in fund investor is a little more cautious a little more cagey almost than, than your general newbie investor we're exceedingly cautious and if it doesn't make sense they pull back a little bit more and a little bit longer than everybody else and that's the only thing i can really wrap my head around of why the stock for this has slid this far or the value has slid this far because it doesn't make sense
And there's got to be a reason why the company switched from bonds to real estate. There's got to be a reason why they went so far in. There's got to be a reason behind all of it. It's just, I haven't seen it in a lot of, I haven't seen it in any of the literature. So I can infer things based on current market and how it relates to the company, but I would like to hear it from the company. And I think that more than anything is why the price has slid this far. Now, if they raise the dividend, I think people it would get people's attention. They would come back, but they would still like to see some type of justification or rationale behind the decision. But then again, that insecurity helps me. I mean, maybe it would help you. 54% off, you don't see every day. Uh, HFRO has been greater than 50% off for a while because of that insecurity. As share price continues to drop and overall portfolio value continues to go up, this chasm widens and you continue get, to get a better deal. So in honestly, worst case scenario, like if the price fell out and the company liquidated, you would liquidate at that higher price, which is still scary. You know, that's a scary thing, right? But I'm I'm willing to take a gamble, and at the same time, I don't see it as a gamble. It's lagging share price. Lag really, they need to increase the dividend, but lagging share price, right? Uh, a dividend that needs to be raised at some point soon, uh, plus some company explanation. And I think we would have that curve start to come back and we would narrow that window. So that's all I got. My, my option for investing is, is picking up at, at least a hundred spot of HFRO and yeah. And, and then we see where the market goes. So if you like my content, consider subscribing to my channel and hit the like button because it really does push videos out. Uh, wherever your destination lies, you're not going to reach that end goal if you don't know where you're going and why. And I, I say this every video. I, I say it on my, on my uh, Facebook page. It's if you look at the standard retirement map, it looks like a Sesame Street pirate map. You're where the ship is. Your retirement is X marks the spot. The problem is there's nothing beyond the treasure chest and life is still lived beyond the treasure chest. So you need a better map. So you can go from where you are to those dreams, like or those multiple treasure islands. But if you're not including those on your overall journey, to where, where whatever goal you're seeking, <laughs> your journey ends on the island, and that's not helpful. But if you make your if you make a better map, you have where you start, and you have this far off vision of where you want to be. Then it's not that it's a solitary treasure island. It's there's multiple treasure islands along your way, and life exists beyond treasure island. You gain the treasure, you enjoy the treasure, and you keep living. And if you want more of that advice, come find me on Facebook and look at my page, Navigate Your Finances, and I go through our 12 steps from getting from where you are to where you want to be. So whatever you have for the week, I hope it goes well. Whatever you're investing in, I hope you know your strategy because you're going to need it because this market is going to continue to be bumpy. It's going to continue to be wavy. And the Fed's going to tinker. Uh, I still think we're either on the cusp of a recession or we're um, in the, po the political fallout is this. If Kamala wins the White House, it won't be called a recession. And if Trump wins the White House, it will be called the worst recession in memory. But it is, it's still going to be a recession either way. And it's not going to, it, it's made worse from the last four years. It's also made worse by the Fed. The Fed is going to allow everybody else to take the blame for their bullshit. And then they're going to be tasked with fixing the problem. The only way to really end the Fed's manipulation 
is to not have the Fed. So until we get a president that's willing to tackle that and all the stuff that comes with that, we're still going to have to play the Fed's game. So we're still living by the interest rate and they're going to manipulate the economy in their best interest because they want to keep their jobs and they are, they could care less about how it impacts you. They could care less about how it impacts you. So long as it makes them look good, they'll have a job. So know your strategy and know the pieces and, and the components of that strategy. The better you learn how to play the Fed, the better you will learn in general, the better you will perform in general. So whatever you have for the week, I hope it goes well. And whatever your strategy is, I hope it works in your favor. And if not, don't be afraid to adjust your strategy. So talk to you later. Bye-bye.